AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here. We're going to take a look at our second example with topic 5.6. 5.6, again, all about using the test for concavity. And we're going to take a look at a little bit more challenging function. So I kind of warned you in the past video that that's typically going to be uh, the way that we move through these examples. And we'll culminate it with our part C, which is probably going to be the roughest one yet. So here we go. You can see that this function's a bit more, uh, let's say, different looking. It's definitely not a polynomial. So let's take a look. Again, the directions say determine the open intervals where uh, the graph would be concave upward or downward. And let's state any points of inflection. Now, as I preface this, I want you to all realize that the, the advanced placement calculus exam experience and advanced placement curriculum um, is a little bit different a lot of times than the college experience. And while the algebra that you're going to see with this question and my part C isn't probably conducive to what you would see on the AP exam, it's very conducive to what the college experience is like. And one of the things that I've always told myself as a teacher is that I'm going to do justice to my students by giving the best of both worlds. I'm, yep, I'm going to prepare them for the AP calculus exam and use a quite a bit of conceptual understanding with, with graphs and, and tables and so forth. But at the same time, we can't let that algebra just get rusty and sit off by the wayside because that's going to really be important when you either retake calculus in college or maybe move on to a higher level. So you're going to see the best of both worlds. That's right. So for part B here, what I would suggest is you rewrite this so that you make your life as easy as possible. We do not need to use the quotient rule to take this derivative. If we rewrite this with a negative one exponent, our, our job in taking the derivative is going to be a little bit more pleasant. And if we take that first derivative, we find that we get negative six quantity x squared plus 3 raised to the negative 2. And then don't forget, so important, we have to know that chain rule. By now, that chain rule should be something like, you know, the back of your hand. Now, here's where it gets really fun, you guys. This problem isn't about you analyzing the first derivative. So we're going to have to work on this just a little bit more. In other words, we're going to have to take another derivative. And I would strongly urge you to rewrite it in this form so that you can see the product rule that's going to have to be used, right? You see that product sign in between the negative 12x and the x squared plus 3 to the negative 2? So that is probably going to be one of the larger challenges of this problem, making sure that we take the derivative right. Because if we don't take the root derivative right, our values for the second derivative equaling 0 are going to be incorrect, which causes our number line to be incorrect, which causes our conclusion to be incorrect. So when we take this derivative, we have negative 12 quantity x squared plus 3 to the negative 2. And then we're going to add negative 12x multiplied by the derivative of x squared plus 3 to the negative 2, which means the negative 2 plops down in front. We have our x squared plus 3 to the negative 3 power and then we multiply by the derivative of what's inside, the x squared plus 3, and that would be a 2 times x. So there it is, your lovely second derivative. The only problem is, good luck trying to set this equal to 0, right? So that's where simplifying can become very important, because we can't pull off this algebra unless we simplify this. And so what I typically tell my students is to spend some time and clean up this derivative. By cleaning up, I mean combining some things like this negative times a negative is going to be a plus. The 12 times the 2 times the 2 is going to be a 48. I have a pair of x's that multiply together to make x squared. And then I have x squared plus 3 to the negative 2. You guys didn't really ask you to do anything that you are incapable of doing. Typically, that's an algebra 1 type of difficulty level in combining some terms. Now, the next thing that I'm going to ask you is probably a little bit more beyond Algebra 1. Maybe it's a more second year algebra type of thing, maybe even a pre-calc type of thing. And I'm going to have you factor out the common factor. And seeing as how there are two terms in this expression, let's call it the orange term 
and the light blue term, I'm going to bring out whatever is in common to both. I notice that I can bring out a 12, and it's really up to you. I think I might go ahead and just bring out the negative sign in addition. I cannot bring out an X because the 12 doesn't have an X with him. Now, I see a common factor of X squared plus 3. I can factor that out as long as I bring out the lowest exponent that I see. And that's where things get kind of tricky. Because when you compare negative 2 and negative 3, we have to all understand that negative 3 is the lowest exponent. Why the lowest exponent? I may have explained this to my students in the past, but if you haven't seen this, what would you factor out of x squared plus x to the fifth? Well, of course you factor out an x squared. Why? Because it's the lower exponent. I can't factor anything higher than an x squared because the x to the fifth, uh, I'm sorry, I can't factor anything higher than an x squared, even though the x to the fifth can do it, the x squared isn't large enough. So you always go for the lower of the two exponents in this case. Now, what does that mean? Well, in this first term, we're going to be left with x squared plus 3 to some power. The question is, what is that power? Well, if you think about reversing this and multiplying back through to get back to this first step, you would have to add those exponents. So what do you do when you take negative 3 plus question mark to get negative 2? Well, the question mark has to equal positive 1, right? And that's what we have for this question mark. And you're going to find out that's very often the case because of the process of taking the derivative takes one away from the exponent. And so really, by and large, the power that doesn't match with any binomial that you bring out it's just going to have a 1 stay inside the brackets. If I factor a minus out of the plus, I got a minus. I've already factored out a, a, four, a 12, so I'm going to have a 4 followed by an x squared. And then luckily for me, the x squared plus 3 to the negative 3 is factored out. I really believe that is the worst part of this question. From this stage, I don't think solving this, simplifying this some more, solving it is really going to be that big of an issue in comparison to what we just did. So let's go ahead and continue with this. We find out that this x squared plus 3 can stay in the bottom or move to the bottom with a positive 3 exponent. I'm going to keep that negative 12 up on top. And then if I combine like terms here, you see I get negative 3x squared plus 3. And I guess if I wanted to go one step further, I probably would factor out a negative sign. And then I'm left with, um, in fact, guys, why don't I factor out a 3 with the negative sign? Let's do that. So if I factor out negative 3, I get a positive 36. And then I have x squared minus 1 on top. And if you're not real sure if this is equivalent, just distribute the negative 12 in and see if you get something similar. Oh, notice I don't here quite get something um, similar. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> I had to double check there. Negative 12 times negative 3x squared is 36x squared. Negative 12 times positive 3 would be a negative 36. Now you have something a lot easier to work with, folks. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to set the second derivative equal to 0 to find those potential points of inflection. And really, by the time I focus on the numerator only, because that's the only time that this fraction here could possibly be 0, I see that x is equal to 1 and negative 1. If I take a look at the potential for the second derivative to be undefined, which is important, it's something that has to be on our radar, I don't have to think much longer, because by the time you cube root both sides and then maybe add the 3 over, you soon see that you can't solve x squared equal to negative 3 because that's going to produce no solution, at least in the real number system. Now you probably could have noticed that from the very beginning because of the plus sign right here, and that's perfectly fine. You don't have to state this sequence of steps to, to 
um, realize that there is no solution. So we only have two critical numbers, and I, I kind of want to be careful. I don't really want to call them critical numbers because they're coming from the second derivative. So let's call them two potential points of inflection. So I'm going to go ahead and draw our number line. We're going to plop down our negative one and our positive one. We always like to label this number line sine of f double prime. That's what you do when you use the test for concavity. And then we have behavior of f down below. And then we just systematically pick some opportunistic values of x, like negative 2, I think would work well. So I want to highlight my f double prime. In fact, I want to highlight the best looking f double prime. Right there it is. That's the best looking f double prime for us to use. And when I type in or plug in negative 2, I get 36 times negative 2 squared, which is positive 4 minus 1, all over positive 4 plus 3 cubed. Well, what I notice about this is that it probably is a pretty nasty looking fraction, but I don't care so much about that as much as I do the fact that I know it's positive. And so the behavior of f along this interval will be such that the curve is concave up. Let's pick a value between negative 1 and positive 1. Boy, we're going to get lucky here because 0 is typically going to be the easiest thing to work with. Hopefully you see that you're going to get a 36 times negative 1. And the denominator is going to be 3 cubed. And it doesn't take a whole lot for us to see that that's going to be a negative result. So our curve would demonstrate concave downward behavior. And then finally, we'll test something on the interval 1 to infinity. 2 works well. 2 is going to give us something very familiar. If you look closely at the values of x in this expression, both are squared which means whether or not you put a positive 2 or a negative 2, you're going to get the same result. And so we know that that's going to be positive, and thus con up is our result. The only thing left to do now is to basically put all of the information here together and write up a statement that tells the, uh, the information provided, which, by the way, was where are the graph concave up and down? And where are the POIs? So we're going to say F is con up on intervals negative infinity to negative 1 and positive 1 to infinity. And the reason is because F double prime is positive on those intervals. All right, we have that taken care of. Now we say the same thing about the concave down feature. So we'll say f is concave down on the interval negative 1 to 1. And the reason would be because f double prime is negative. And since there's only one interval, I'm just going to name it by name because it's probably quicker to say negative 1 to 1 than it says on that interval. And then you're going to start to see a graph here. I'm going to share that with you here in a moment as I scroll down. And the last piece of information is to state what the points of inflection are. And so the POIs are going to occur at x equal negative 1 and x equal positive 1. And we just use the same kind of explanation. The rationale or the reasoning is because f double prime, you can be more formal and say f double prime of x, changes signs. You don't have to state how the sign changes. Positive to negative to negative to positive, either way is good. We'll say that we change signs at x equal negative 1 and positive 1. And there you have it, a really good explanation for that particular problem. 
I know it's a lot of work. There's a lot going on when you're in analyzing functions. It's very likely you're not going to see this on an AP exam because it, it's too much work. But it could be a part of a college type of a curriculum, a good college question, where the problem could be worth several points and, of course, partial credit is earned. Let's pull my picture out of the way and look at the graph over here. Uh, it's kind of small, but I think you guys can probably see that we do have concave up behavior. Let's see if I can draw on this. And then when I get to negative 1, that's a point of inflection, folks. I'm going to change my behavior to concave down, but I'm going to then switch back to con up after I get to positive 1. And you can certainly see uh, the points of inflection that are truly occurring there. Told you this was a challenging question. I've got another one ready for you, but to give you a, a sneak preview here, when we go into part C, we have a slightly more robust function that's gonna require a little bit different approach in order to take its, inter, uh, its derivative. So I'd like you to check it out because if you can do example one part C, you can probably do anything. Hope you check it out. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next time.